Hey YouTube, Matt's back and I have something I don't think I've ever had before on this channel. A plan! Yeah, I know you're having a good laugh at this, but this is important. It's woodworkers fighting cancer time again. And this is part of a really nice set of plans and printout templates that you can get over at thewoodwhisperer.com. Thank you very much to Mark Spagnolo and company for sponsoring this whole thing, putting in the legwork to put the templates together and do the demo build. And for the donations, uh, this video is going to score 10 bucks for cancer research. And it's also gonna score uh, some money for our local animal shelter. Uh, around these parts, animal shelters are funded by private donations and such things. So when this project is complete, it's going down to the thrift store for the local animal shelter so that they can recoup a few bucks off of the investment as well. Okay, enough chatting. Plan of attack here is to follow this, a cut list, and bust up this sheet of four by eight A1 domestic plywood into a couple of more manageable hunks so that we can start creating what will eventually be pieces for tables and chairs. There are no dust problems and lots of space out in the driveway, so that's usually where I cut down my 4x8 sheets. The measurements for this project are a lot more critical than most because we're trying to squeeze it out of a single sheet. Some blue tape helps to keep the cut lines a little bit cleaner, keeps the veneer from being totally torn up. After you've got the 4x8 sheet ripped into manageable panels, you can go to the table saw and start cutting it down into individual parts. It's a really good idea to label each one of those parts as they come off the saw because you don't have enough spare wood to cut them again. And certainly, anytime you're cutting multiple parts of the same size, cut them all before you move the fence, even if it means you have to go back and forth between a couple of panels to get them. Table saw work is done. We've got all of the 4x8 sheet bucked up into the various pieces of the chairs and table with the exception of the chair sides. That's what comes out of this piece right here. In order to keep this project down to one sheet of plywood, the tolerances are pretty tight on the cuts. The chairs are gonna come out of here, you know, one this way and then flip it around one this way and, and here and here. So it is important that I get the first cut here, you know, pretty much right on the edges of the plywood and then pretty tight so that I've got room to get the other three out of here. So what I did, I printed out the full size template, I taped it all together, and I have it sitting here on the panel pretty much exactly where I want it. The, the tip of the top of the side of the chair is up here almost to the edge of the plywood and likewise with the feet down here at the bottom. But my template is not attached per se, except for this piece of blue tape right here on the side. What that lets me do is flip the whole thing over without really moving it. Now I can take my spray adhesive, I can spray the wood, I can spray the template, let it tack up, and I don't have to worry about it sticking down in the wrong place. I can just flip it back over and fold it down and it'll be exactly where I want it to be. It only takes a minute or two for this stuff to tack up. So we'll start pressing it down from this side and then work my way up to the top. All right, I'm gonna give that about 15 minutes to fully set and then we can start cutting it out with the jigsaw. The most critical thing with the jigsaw is not to go inside the line. Yeah, you wanna get close because you're gonna to have to work this down by hand but you're gonna be really sad if you have to putty it back together. You have to drill some holes to get the jigsaw into the middle section. I did it on the drill press so I could get nice and close to the corners, and I did all four corners to make the jigsaw work easier. The ends of these things need to be dead flat if the chairs are gonna sit right, so I cut them by hand with the Japanese saw. Time for the actual work work, as in hand work, part of this whole thing. My template is glued on, on this side facing me, and I don't have a whole lot of stock to remove. I got pretty close to the line with the, with a jigsaw blade. Definitely worth the investment for a nice new sharp blade so you get clean edges. Um, but there's no getting around the fact that I have, you know, bumps and lumps and such things. The, the jigsaw is not a fine working tool by any stretch of the imagination. So sandpaper on a block, sandpaper loose, 
rasp, flat and rounded side. Um, might bust out the block plane here at some point. Really wish I had a spoke shave, but what are you gonna do? Elbow grease, that's really the only thing left. Sanding the rounded corners of this thing requires rounded sanding material. A dowel rod works great. All right, not too shabby. One chair template slash piece of the chair. I have already made a mistake. I went ahead and scraped the template off of here, completely forgetting that it had spots for uh, some drilling that I need to do. So I'm gonna end up measuring and marking that later. Need to use this to lay out three more of these which come out of this piece. So I'm gonna mark those, rough them out, and then I will uh, bust out the flush trim bit in the router to make them all exactly like this one. As long as you keep your speeds under control and your bit is pretty sharp, the results of the flush trimming are gonna come out quite nicely. Well, if there's a messier operation in the shop than flush trimming with a router bit, I don't know what it is, but the results are well worth it. This chair side is not the world's most complicated shape, but cutting four of them out separately and getting them this the same, not happening. I will probably clamp them together when I do my final sanding. That'll dress the edges to be just spot on, and the nice wide surface will keep me nice and square with the sanding block. And with the chair sides cut out, I'm left with the legs. The legs. As the last of the sculpted pieces, the sides of this thing are curved, so they're gonna be the same jigsaw flush trim routine, but the five degree angles at the top and bottom, we can take care of on the chop saw. I'm set up for plus or minus the correct angle, and I'm cutting the legs in pairs to make sure that the two ends match up. The cutoffs make perfect stop blocks for the angled cut. Okay, I got all eight of my leg pieces cut, and I cut everything in pairs, tops and bottoms, always kept them in pairs. So if there's any little tiny variation uh, from set to set, it'll at least be spread out over the distance of the table. From here on out, it is the same exact process as the chairs. I have my template uh, blue taped this time in the middle, so I can come back and I can put my spray adhesive down and make sure that the template goes exactly where I want it to go. You would think it would be really critical to get these parallel edges of the template lined up with the parallel edges of the wood, but it turns out that it really isn't. What's critical is that these edges are parallel. Uh, if the template is cocked a degree or two, all it's gonna do is change the profile of your curves and frankly, who cares? So uh, let me skip a bit, brother, as they would say in the Monty Python movies, and uh, do what I did to the chairs and come back when I have eight workable legs. My dust collector is only about a 50th of a horsepower, but she's cute as a button and she's keeping up with the jigsaw just fine. Besides, show me a big multi-thousand dollar cyclone that'll vacuum the bench for you. One, two, three, four sets of legs, all flush trimmed to the same template. Downside of using an actual workpiece for a template, I don't know if you can see that on camera. Yeah, lots of router burn on here, uh, even with a brand new bearing on that bit. I got some, some burn along the side of here. It's gonna be a painted project, so once I sand that, it won't be any big deal, but if you were looking to stain or do a clear coat or something like that, you probably wanna invest in the template stock so that uh, this doesn't happen to you. One last fabrication step before I glue these up. The back of the two pieces needs to be chopped down to fit the side rail of the table box. And there is a line on the template to mark where that should be, but quite frankly, it's a little safer to just grab uh, whichever is the uglier of your two legs. It's probably gonna be the one that was on top of the stack when it went through the chop saw because that does not do nice things to the veneer on the plywood. Anyway, get this, line it up with the top of your leg and that'll give you the exact line that you need to cut. I'm actually gonna mark it with a knife because I want a real exact line. I don't want this to be off by a, a pencil width as anal retentive as that sounds. Um, more it's about scoring the veneer on the plywood. I'm gonna cut these by hand with my Japanese saw, so I'm not too worried about messing them up, but if I score the veneer with this knife, I have even less danger that it's gonna tear out. I drilled the bolt holes in my template piece using the marks on the paper. Now I'm gonna use that template to mark the holes on the rest of the legs. 
I do want to make sure however that they get in nice and straight so I'm going to do the rest of the drilling on the drill press. Finally time for a little bit of assembly on the legs. The most important thing is to remember that you need mirror image pairs of these legs. If you glue all four of them up the same way, you're only going to be able to use two. So when you lay them out for glue up, make sure you've got one bent this way, one bent the other way, back and forth, so that when you're done, you have two rights and two lefts, or two fronts, two backs, however you want to think about it. I went out and grabbed a bottle of Tight Bond 3 to glue this up um, for two reasons. One, I have a lot of clamps to put on here, and this has about twice the working time of the original tight bond, at least in my conditions. The other thing is that this glue is waterproof, and I have no idea where this table is going to end up. It's possible somebody could put it out on a porch, it could get rained on, it's a kid's table, they could be spilling who knows what. Uh, so for the extra, you know, buck or two that tight bond 3 costs, I think it's worth the investment for this particular project. And the one other thing that I did, I put just a real light pencil line on here where the end of the short piece is going to be, so I know how far up to run the glue. Now what I've done here is I have glued all four of these things together and then come back to the first one to put the clamps on because the glue starts to tack and it makes it so that you can still move this piece around if you have to but it doesn't slip and slide like it does with fresh wet glue when you're trying to secure the clamps. All right, the box for the table has four aprons, too short, too long. The short aprons sit inside of the long aprons. It's a simple butt joint on the corner that's going to get screwed together. And basically what I decided to do was to try the stop dado and if it gets to be too frustrating cleaning out the plywood with a chisel, then I'll just come back and cut it the rest of the way. I very carefully laid out my two short aprons and the one long apron across the bottom piece that I have. Uh, came up with the stick out, if you will, on the bottom piece and divvied that in half to get my groove depth here. And I have checked that with a scrap piece to see that I'm getting the right depth on my dado and also that my dado is the right distance up from the bottom of the piece. I want the plywood when it's sitting in here. We're going to cut the rabbit so that the, the tongue is on the top of this thing here. I want it to be just below the what's going to be the bottom of the apron. I, I want, you know, a sixteenth of an inch kind of a reveal there. I think it actually looks nicer than if it's totally flush and it gives me just a little bit of wiggle room. If I cut something not quite right, at least the bottom panel won't be sticking out. Cleaning up these chisels by hand really does not take very long. The first thing I'm going to do is come in here and I'm going to set my end, which I have marked by holding up one of the short apron pieces flush with the end of the piece and just marking where the end of the groove is. And then I can come in and using the side of the existing groove, mark this out. If your chisels aren't sharp, you'll know it because the grain in plywood, of course, goes every which way you can think of. And once you have that, these pieces come out like nothing. Now the very bottom of the groove, it's often handy to turn your chisel upside down, as it were. Go, go bevel down with it. That way, it doesn't want to bite too far in. Back to the dado stack to put the rabbit on the bottom piece of the table box. Uh, Mark did this with a rabbiting bit in the router, but I don't have a rabbiting bit for the router, so uh, we're doing it this way. The height of the dado blade determines the thickness of the, the tongue that you end up with on here. So grab yourself a piece of stock and, you know, wiggle it up and down until you get the fit just right. The length of the tongue is determined by essentially your, your fence. And in order to get this to be a clean cut right up to the edge, you need to do the sacrificial fence routine. 
So I've been sneaking this thing one way and the other, and I think I finally got the profile I want. It seems to fit in there pretty nicely, nice and square. I have maybe a 32nd of an inch of spare space on the end of the tongue in there, but that's, uh, that's just gonna make it go together a little easier. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut the bottom. A piece of angle iron keeps everything nice and square while I drill my pilot holes for the screws. I have to do my countersinking on the drill press because I don't have a countersink bit for the hand drill. You might be able to save yourself this step. Gluing and screwing this together is, well, it's gluing and screwing. Put the glue on, get everything together nice and tight, and then drive the screws on into your pre-drilled holes. Just be careful not to go crazy and split those plywood ends out. This is a great time to take your roundover bit to all the sharp corners in this project. Here I'm using a trim router and a quarter inch roundover bit. Well, I'm very glad I was able to do all that rounding over and preliminary sanding outside. Phew, what a pile of dust. Everything has been uh, knocked down to 120 grit, which gave me the opportunity to see what I was dealing with in terms of voids or glue separation or anything like that. Um, not too bad, A1 domestic plywood, only had a couple of small little things that I needed to, to fill and then sand back down. Of course, all of the curved parts have to be done by hand in order to keep them even. Last bit before we're ready to think about putting this together is the hardware. I have some T-nuts, which are gonna go on the inside of the top box. I have some threaded inserts that need to go into the ends of all of these stretchers for the chairs, uh, as well as some dowels that are gonna get glued into these pieces, but uh, are only gonna have holes on the chair sides. That's gonna give it a lot of rigidity. It's gonna keep it from twisting, but I'm gonna rely on the three screws that go through here and into the inserts to actually hold the thing together. And to get those holes in the right spot, I made this. This is a poor man's doweling jig. I need to take this block, I need to put it in the right spot on the chairs, and I need to drill through them. And what I'm gonna do, just to make sure that my two mirror image chair halves line up exactly, is I'm going to gang them together I'm gonna set them down on the nice flat bench and probably just uh, put some spring clamps or something on there to hold them together. I will measure and mark and locate my block, but I'm only gonna drill the center hole, which is the through hole, it goes all the way through for the bolt. I'm gonna drill that on the drill press through both left and right sides of the chair. Then I will take them apart and I will use that as a guide to get the block in the right spot to drill the holes that don't go all the way through for the dowels. To mark the ends of the chair stretchers and the chair backs, I took the same block that I was using as a template earlier and I glued it down to this thing so I could put a stop on it. It allows me to just slide this in here and mark all three of these with the hand drill running in reverse as usual. With all four of the stretchers put together, plus some extra pieces at the bottom, I've got a wide enough surface that I can stand these boards up on end and finish drilling my dowel holes with a Forstner bit. Well, that's a lot of measure and marking and drilling and frankly, fingers crossed. Uh, but the end result of it is that once you're done, it is really, really pretty easy to take this pile of parts and turn it into this chair. I want these threaded inserts to be very strong and I don't want them to blow out the sides of my parts. So I'm using epoxy and I've got a clamp on here just to keep everything nice and solid. They go in pretty straight if you take gentle strokes with the Allen key. Just make sure you wipe off any extra epoxy before you take that Allen key out, otherwise the epoxy will be down in your threads. The dowels are much more straightforward, good old yellow glue down in the hole and on the sides of the dowel, then just tap them in with the hammer. They should go pretty easily. And once your glue is all set up, you can start to assemble the chair. The Dowels should fit into the, the holes on one side of the chair. You can get the other side on there. It'll be, a, it'll be a snug fit unless your holes are exactly right, which of course they won't be. But just some real light taps should be all it takes to get it together. 
Now, when it comes to putting the other side together, it can be a little bit tricky to get all six dowels lined up at the same time. It helps if you just start the bolts in the threaded inserts, but leave them loose. Leave them sticking out as much as you can so you get wiggle room to move things around. And once you're sure all the dowels are started, you can come back and tighten these down. You don't have to crank these down too tightly. They're amazingly strong, especially with the inserts epoxied into the cross piece. Before you know it, you've got two chairs. I marked the leg holes on the table box by clamping the leg in place and just touching the surface with the small drill bit. I drill through with a block behind the back to make sure the veneer doesn't tie out and then use a hammer to install the T-nuts. All right, well, very much like the chairs, once you get all of the drilling done and all the hardware in, the table goes together like nothing. The bolts go through the legs, and because we drilled the holes in here based on using the leg as a template, they line up perfectly every time. And just like that, you have a table. Well, you have most of a table. Still needs a top, which has been noticeably absent to this point in the project. Not really a reason for that, it's just dull. It's a flat sheet. Uh, it's been rounded over, it's been sanded. It sits right on top of here. The only thing left is how to attach it. Tabletop is clamped to the base, and I used this square to set the end depth, and this one to set the side overhang. I can check the whole way around and just make sure that this thing is dead center, perfectly square to the base, exactly where I want it to be. The tabletop attaches to the base with these. These blocks get glued to the tabletop, but along the side apron. Once they're all set up, we'll come back, we'll drill a hole through the block and the apron. That takes a pin, which holds the tabletop in place. And as it turns out, those other clamps have a tendency to twist as they tighten down which was pulling this block out of alignment. So it's back to the good old C-clamps. I used some wooden drawer pulls as the basis for my tabletop pins, drilled them out to accept this quarter inch steel rod after taking a trip to the bench grinder. Nice round ends so that nobody gets poked. I want the final painted finish to be just about bomb proof. So I'm starting by spraying on a good heavy coat of Kills White Primer. The spraying is probably not necessary, but heck, I have the sprayer, why not? After the primer is completely dry, which takes almost 24 hours, it gets sanded to 320 to leave a nice smooth surface for paint. I picked plain old Rust-Oleum white gloss because it's going to be readily available to whoever gets this table and chairs if they need to make repairs. For the top, I went chalkboard. Thought that would be fun for kids. I tried brushing on the first coat and then decided that a roller makes for a much more chalkboard-like surface. Even coverage and lots of coats are the key to making this look nice. Okay, well, except for the fact that I can't draw, this thing is done. Chalkboard top came out great. Uh, I won't tell you that it was easy though. It is a, a good bit of fooling with if you want it to come out nicely. I had to put down two coats of it, sand it back to 320, put down another coat, sand that to 400, and then 4 aught steel wool in order to get it to a surface that frankly feels like a chalkboard and feels like it's gonna hold up to some kids. I left the drawer pulls on my tabletop pins unfinished, except for a couple coats of shellac. I think it's a nice accent, shows that this thing is actually, in fact, made out of wood. Uh, when I had visions of dyeing the top, before I thought of the chalkboard thing, I was going to dye these to match, but uh, I don't want them chalkboard, so natural it is. Altogether, I'm pretty happy with this. It didn't take that much putty to get the, the plywood to cooperate and give me nice crisp edges. The fit and finish of everything is good as I can do with the tools I have here in my shop. If I were going to build another one of these, what would I do differently? Well, I'm still not 100% sold on this arrangement with the, with the pins. Uh, it works great. Don't get me wrong, that tabletop's not going anywhere. And uh, in the end, that's probably the most important thing. But it's a little bit fussy getting this thing lined up and getting the pins in there. So this is going to be a mom and dad activity, taking the tabletop on and off. Uh, given how small it is and the age of kid that'll be using it, that's probably a good thing. Uh, if you were going to build it for some older kids, I would suggest bite the bullet, get a second sheet of plywood, upscale it a little bit, and then maybe see about a uh, you know no slam hinge or something for the top. All right, well, that's going to wrap up this episode of Miscellaneous Matt. Thanks once again to Mark Spagnola and company. 
for putting this whole thing together, providing the project plans and the, the inspiration, frankly. Uh, those of you watching, you still have until the end of November to put one of these together yourself to qualify for a donation for cancer research. Or uh, if you don't feel like actually building a table, maybe you could just head on over to thewoodwhisperer.com and make a straight up donation. Uh, any little bit will help. Thanks for watching, and as always, stay safe, YouTube.